Hi, good evening. <clears throat> I'm Rani Avisar, the Dean of the Rosenstiel School. It's my uh, pleasure and honor to welcome everybody this evening, uh, both in the auditorium and uh, remotely uh, in Zoom. Uh, this is the last lecture of our uh, 22nd, uh, 27th, uh, something like that. <laughs> we have been having that series for a while, uh, even older than I am. So to tell you uh, all about it. Um, I would like to say that uh, we always keep the best uh, lecture for uh, the end. I am sure that you are not going to be disappointed with this evening program. Um, please note that uh, uh, we are still operating under some COVID restrictions. So we ask that you do not uh, eat or drink in the auditorium. However, the wearing of the mask is not mandatory anymore. We encourage it, uh, especially for people that are immunocompromised. So please uh, uh, respect, uh, uh, respect that. I'd like to uh, take a moment to uh, thank um, our sponsors, which is obviously very important for a program like that. We have the Shepard Broad Foundation, Bill Galway, Cheryl Gold, the Key Biscayne Community Foundation, uh, the KB Life Enhancement Forum, John Mikon Family Foundation, the William McKeehan Trust, Nicole and Myron Wang, and Southern Glazers Wine and Spirit. So in, keep it, uh, in keeping with the spirit of what we have been doing in this uh, lecture series, uh, we were planning to have with us uh, this evening Dr. Uh, Nikki uh, uh, Trader jones Unfortunately, um, she's not uh, feeling too well, and uh, we are going to uh, try to uh, do something to replace her irreplaceable presentation. So I apologize for uh, not being able to cover as well as uh, she would have uh, presented this topic. But uh, we'd like to introduce you to the Voss Marine Invertebrate Collection at the Rosenstiel School. And the collection is an internationally recognized uh, certified research museum for Atlantic tropical marine invertebrate. It houses thousands of marine life specimens that have been collected over the past 80 years throughout the Caribbean basin. Since the 1930s, our scientists and students have been adding to this vast collection, considered one of the largest in the world. The collection, which has a few rivals as to number, geographic, and vertical ranges of Atlantic tropical species, is of exceptional value as a research, teaching, reference, and data resource. We'd like to share a video uh, hosted by our collection director the, um, uh, and Rosenstiel professor, Dr. Nikki Trelor Knowles, highlighting our marine invertebrate collection and uh, please go ahead with the video. An invertebrate is an animal that doesn't have a backbone. They're the most populous organisms on this earth, but they're also the ones that we understand the least about. I'm Nikki Trailer Knowles. I'm an assistant professor in marine biology and ecology, and I'm also the director of the Voss Marine Invertebrate Collection. It's a collection of marine invertebrates, so ones that are found all over the Western Atlantic, as well as Western Panama. The animals that are housed here, many of them are not found anywhere else in the world. And it's really a great snapshot into time for us to understand not only the evolution of organisms, but also to understand the genetic persistence of organisms. The Voss Marine Invertebrate Collection started around 1943 by Walton Smith, and in 1948, Gil Voss took over the collection as a graduate student. Later, he met Nancy Voss, and they got married, and then started really running this place to become a really world-class research museum. So we have over 132,000 lots that span over 23 phyla. Many of the animals that we house here have never been characterized before. And so we have this unique opportunity to discover new organisms, 
as well as understand from a climate change perspective how organisms' ability to adapt to climate change has shifted over time. Besides that, it, it can extract the DNA for the genetic studies to try to understand evolution on biodiversity. It starts off with the in the order of classification. Nancy Voss, in my opinion, is the reason that this collection's still here. When Gil Voss died, she took over and really helped sustain and maintain this collection. Without her, I wouldn't be sitting here talking about it. She was 92 years old until she was coming here every single day. She was an amazing trailblazing scientist and researcher. That's really what drives me is that I can carry on her legacy. Whether they knew it or not with the way they were, were collecting, it's actually, I think, even become more valuable than they initially thought. You could collect a coral from a specific spot that was previously collected here. We could do DNA analysis on it and compare how the DNA has shifted over time. I think that's really valuable to help us understand the effects of climate change on invertebrates. So a lot of different scientists from around the world use our resources, in particular a lot from South America and Central America, and it's a snapshot into history that if we lose this, we're losing so much information. The preservation of the, of the material is important, but at the same time, we want all this information to be accessible. We really envision that we can revitalize the research and education here. We really want to incorporate graduate education as well as undergraduate education to help enhance and broaden the reach of this collection. Uh, thanks, Nikki, if you are listening to this. Uh, really appreciate Very nice video. Good, great job. We depend upon uh, donor uh, contributions for it to continue to operate and thrive. And I hope that you will consider making a gift to the Vos Marine Invertebrate Collection by contacting our development team, Jennifer Dillon, um, at uh, the email that is provided at the bottom of this uh, slide and uh, contacting her uh, directly uh, to help us with that. It is now my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Cynthia Barnett. Cynthia is an award-winning uh, environmental journalist who has reported on water and climate worldwide. Her writing has appeared in The Atlantic, The New York Times, The Los Angeles Times, The Wall Street Journal, and among many, many others. Just two weeks ago, National Geographic published an article about the horse conch, one of the world's biggest sea snails at risk of extinction. She is the author of four books, including Rain, a natural and cultural history, which was long listed for the National Book Award, and her latest, The Sound of the Sea, Seashells and the Fate of the Oceans. Cynthia, welcome to Sea Secret. We are delighting to have you with us this evening. Thank you. It's so, it's so great to be here, and that collection looks very familiar to me. As you can imagine, I was in those kinds of collections all over um, during the six years that I worked on a book about seashells and the wonderful marine mollusks that make them. And this institution has been important to the book as well, um, as I'll talk about a little bit more, but uh, Gil Voss, who you saw, in the, in the video is in the book um, for, for some, of the, uh, some of the story about the Queen Conch actually involves him and his efforts to uh, sound the alarm about what was happening to the species. So um, thank you for having me and to, and to all of the sponsors. I thought I would begin by telling you how I came to write this book. Uh, some of you may know this very small seashell museum on Sanibel Island. Has anyone been to Sanibel Island? So this is called the, the Bailey Matthews National <laughs> Shell Museum. It's a wonderful little museum. I had been invited there to give a book talk about one of my previous books, 
And after the talk, I went out to dinner with the director, and she told me this really disturbing story. Uh, the museum had surveyed visitors to find out how much they already knew about seashells. And so most of the visitors to the museum were tourists visiting Florida with their children. And these surveys revealed that 90% of visitors had no idea that a seashell was made by a living animal. Most people thought they were some kind of rocks or stones. And that, that bothered me so much I couldn't fall asleep that night in my, in my hotel room. I was tossing and turning and I think by the time I finally fell asleep, I knew that I wanted to write about, about seashells, not just for the shells themselves, but for the, the metaphor that I, that I felt, and, and that is, you know, just, just as we love seashells for the gorgeous exterior rather than the life inside, and this, of course, is a, is a wonderful queen conch with its little eyes poking out on the right-hand side, just as we love seashells for the exterior rather than the life inside, I think that's really how we know the oceans, right? We love the oceans as the beautiful backdrop of life rather than the very source. So we sort of love the oceans as a postcard without understanding what's happening beneath the waves. So as an environmental writer, I am really drawn to the metaphor of listening. Um, the, the metaphor, the, the, the idea of writing about mollus for that metaphor of listening. So listening to, to nature, listening to science, uh, trying to listen to voices that have been unheard in history. So we've long held seashells to our ears to seek wisdom in their polished whorls. And the amazing thing is how often they uh, answer with clear truths in murky times. So extinct shelled creatures like the spiraling ammonoids gave fossilized proof of evolution. Uh, seashells on mountaintops told a story of shifting continents and rising and falling seas, articulating an Earth history much older than the 6,000 years suggested by the Bible. These, neander these cockle shells with round holes in the top, stashed in a Neanderthal cave in Spain, were collected empty for reasons that were fundamentally aesthetic and not for food. So it's finds like these that have helped scientists, modern, modern archaeologists and anthropologists overturn two centuries of uh, poorly conceived science that Neanderthals were dim-witted brutes. So I love this role as the seashell um, the seashell as fact checker. I really came to think of them as the world's great fact checkers. So if you've started the book, you know that I open with that Neanderthal shell cache and remember my own daughter's shell collecting in childhood. And there is something just fundamentally aesthetic, right, about seashells that pleases the brain. It has to do with beauty and patterns and flourishes, textures and colors, but I think it also has to do with memory. Both that long arc of human memory or pre-human memory, going back to the Neanderthals and, and before them, and perhaps extending to our own childhood memories of collecting seashells. So seashells are the earliest known keepsakes tucked into graves. This small cone shell, Conus abreus, still holds its tint after 75,000 years interred. The stubby cone was unearthed from the grave of a four to six month old infant in a large rock shelter in South Africa known as Border Cave. It had been notched by hand strung onto a pendant and worn for many year, years before being placed with that Stone Age baby. So I'm just, I'm just so moved 
by that, by that idea that someone so long ago wore this shell as an, as an amulet, as a necklace, and then placed it in the grave of that baby. And, and, and here it is, um, here it is holding that memory. So seashells were jewelry before gems and they were money before coins. So sometimes you will, he you will hear the cryptocurrency dudes say that crypto is the world's first global money. I can tell you that that's not true. The first global money was a small um, shining cowrie, cowrie shell. In the summer of 2019, my teenage son and I traveled to the Maldives and then on to West Africa to follow the route of this first global money. The devastating part of that story is that cowries purchased an estimated third of the enslaved Africans forced to the Americas. And that story um, really girds what I feel is the book's most important meditation. And that is that we won't be able to fix our environmental problems without first righting human injustices. So again, in both nature and the human story, I really came to see seashells as the world's great fact checkers. Shell middens rose in North America like temples in the ancient world, such as the great cities of Shell that were built by the Calusa on the southwest coast 1,500 years before the Spanish arrived on these shores. Some early scientists and historians considered the mounds the mere garbage heaps of nomadic people, but the shells, contoured by long ago hands to gird homes, sanctuaries, and public buildings, or buried in ancient shell work factories, establish major pre-Columbian cities on US soil. So these mounds make clear that the new world was hardly new, uh, much less settled by bearded men on sailing ships. So in other words, seashells were often more accurate recorders of human history than the humans who wrote it down. So that's the really cool thing about them. As you saw in the video, they can tell us so much about biological history and climate history. They also have a lot to tell us about ourselves, and that's what I found so compelling about working on this book. And since I mentioned the shell work factory of native pe people, I'm going to show you something funny. This is the shell factory that I used to go to when I was a kid in Fort Myers, and it, it still exists. Um, it, it doesn't look quite that way because there's no, there's no water anywhere near it. I-75 runs by it now, but... I like to joke now that before there was a shell factory in Fort Myers, there were shell work factories in Fort Myers and indeed all over Florida. And um, all of these incredible Calusa tools were honed from the iron hard shell of the lightning whelk, which Calusa people also ate in large numbers. So they hafted a wooden handle through the shell's crown to make a heavy hammer or a sharp ax. They sharpened the outer lip into a uh, cutting edge for hollowing out their huge canoes. And they honed lightning whelks into spear, po spear points, pounders, perforators, fishing weights, and many, many other tools. One of the things I find so fascinating about the lightning whelk story is how far lightning whelks were traded to, uh, from Florida to other parts of North America. Um, so particularly to the continent's first great city, Cahokia. Is anyone from St. Louis or has anyone been to Cahokia? So great, you know the story I'm about to tell. Um, Cahokia rose across the Mississippi River from what is now St. Louis, Missouri, a thousand years ago. It was home to 20,000 to 30,000 people in its day. So again, this idea that Native American people were, were always nomadic and kind of roaming around um, is, is not the case at all. There were extraordinary cities 
on uh, the continent. So a few of the mounds are still standing. Monk's Mound with a base as large as the Great Pyramids of Egypt. So the people of Cahokia revered marine shells, and marine shells are found throughout these mounds. And by far, um, the, num the number of shells is astonishing, but by far the most abundant shell found in the mounds of Cahokia are lightning whelks from Florida more than a thousand miles away. So it, it's this you know, incredible story. Uh, I can't tell you the whole story, but I, but I have a chapter on lightning whelks and native people. And it's just extraordinary to think um, about those shells being traded. And of course, just like today, if you studied economics, you know that the farther away from the source, um, you something something travels the more valuable it, it becomes. So the the marine shells were particularly important to inland um, peoples. So shells really tell us who we are. They are always reminding us of who we are. And when the colonists arrived on the eastern seaboard, native people hand carved North Atlantic channel whelk and quahog clams into small purple and white beads and wove them into wampum. Uh, these are incredible, be beautiful uh, wampum, wampum belt on the left. And you can still see wampum belts in, in many museums today. And people think of wampum as money, but wampum was actually closer to discourse and language than to money. When, Europe, when Europeans um, watched Native Americans working with wampum and trading wampum and sharing wampum, they interpreted it as money. And Europeans actually started making wampum themselves. And these laws and customs really collided as the colonists appropriated shell beads for what they often described as mercenary transactions. So those of you who are malacologists or conchologists in the room probably know what I'm about to tell you. That definition of mercenary transactions stuck with the great Swedish naturalist Linnaeus as he was working through his two name classifications for plant and animal life. And he named the American quahog used for purple wampum mercenaria after those mercenary transactions. And to this day, it's called mercenaria, mercenaria. And these are the wonderful clams being replanted all over Florida um, as an as a, uh, adaptation strategy to try to, to try to clean up pollution and um, to try to restore some of the great bays uh, around Florida. So indeed, seashells reveal human excess. Uh, the curiosity cabinets of 17th century Europe were a great deal of fun to write about. Uh, they, they, in some places, kings and queens would have royal shell rooms and, and grottos or entire cottages made of shell. Uh, and there was, a, there was a shell madness at the time. Again, shells that came from far away were considered very valuable. So there is a time, there's a time in 17th century um, Holland when shells such as a cone shell or any other tropical, really beautiful tropical shell from the Pacific were selling for as much as a great painter like Rembrandt, who was also caught up in the shell madness. So you may have seen Rembrandt's um, famous etching called The Shell. Uh, he, this was from his own collection, and he got caught up in the, in, the, in the shell madness, paying a great deal of money for single seashells. And he, in fact, um, had to file for bankruptcy. He was one of the many artists in history who died um, impoverished, because partially because he had spent so much money on these extraordinarily expensive seashells and, and tulips. There was also, this was the same time as the Dutch tulip madness. Uh, so in the, in the following century, and this is one of my favorite stories in the book, in the following century, 
um, and into the into the 1800s, when a middle when a middle class began to grow in Europe, the shell madness now spread to the middle class. So shells were becoming less expensive as more and more tropical shells were coming in on the great trading ships and people realized they were not as rare, rare as they thought they were. One of the very favorite um, tropical shells in England was a, a queen conch shell. So before Queen Victoria's time, they were called pink conchs, but Queen Victoria loved them very much and in her time, um, they became queen conch. She loved the pink shell so much that she had her own cameo cutter on the on the royal court to make her cameos out of the out of the beautiful shells. So um, sometimes when you hear about the story of the collapse of queen conchs in Florida, it kind of gets tied to mid-century America and you know, just America's own crazy rise of consumerism and love of queen conchs, it actually dates back much farther than that. I found some uh, scientists in, in England in the 19th century who were already warning that queen conchs um, may not survive if they would be overfished. And he actually, um, this one scientist wanted to put a limit on queen conchs and he couldn't due to the queen loving the queen conchs, which is sort of like, sort of like politics today, right? So anyway, um, the so-called conch republic of the Florida Keys has now no functional queen conch population and less, less known is that pressure dating all the way to Queen Victoria's name, uh, reign, and um, the era that gave the shell its name. Now, I want to tell you um, one of my favorite stories in the book is about a small shop owner in England who was selling those seashells during the shell madness. So this fellow's name was Marcus Samuel Sr., he was a Jewish curio shop owner on the east end of London, and he would sell um, shells. Some of his ads would say, small shells for ladies' work, because Victorian ladies would make these you know, beautiful shell frames, and kind of the same shell art you see today uh, comes out of Victorian times. So he had his little shop, and he had the idea that he could make little shell encrusted boxes and sell him at beach resort towns like in Brighton and Margate and, and so on. He even came up with the idea to put the little sticker on the bottom, Gifts, gift from Margate, gift from Brighton. And you still see that on shell boxes today. And you still see this kind of thing in shell shops all over the world. So the amazing thing about his story is that um, he made his fortune selling the little shell boxes. He grew his, um, he, had, he had hired 40 women in the East End to manufacture these boxes. He sold them all over England and then he sold them all over Europe. And what began as Marcus Samuel's tiny seashell shop would become one of the largest oil companies in the world. <laughs> So in the second generation, Marcus Samuel's sons, namely Marcus Samuel Sr., um, kept his good relations with all the trading partners. So Marcus Samuel was trading um, seashells, but also other cool objects like ostrich feathers and things like that. He was trading with Japan and his sons kept up those good relationships and they're trading with Japan and they, they start trading kerosene. And this is during, during the time when John D. Rockefeller and Standard Oil are really growing in the United States in the late, um, this is the late 19th century. John D. Rockefeller is basically trying to expand from the US and uh, dominate the global oil industry. At the same time, the Samuel Sons 
want to do the same thing, but they're the ones who figured out how to build the first safe oil tanker that could send oil through the Suez Canal. And their first tanker was called the Murex, which is named after a seashell. They named, they named the first tanker the Murex, and they named all their tankers after their father's beloved shells. And of course, they named their company Shell. And Shell Oil still, um, still names its tankers after seashells. In fact, there is a Murex plying the seas today. The one on the right is carrying uh, liquefied natural gas around the world. So as you can imagine, there's some great poignancy and irony in this story. And, and I could talk all night about the irony, but I just want to make a couple of points about it. One is the, the logo of Shell Oil itself, right? Um, I, I also teach journalism in a college of journalism and communications at the University of Florida in Gainesville. So we teach branding, and this um, yellow scallop is one of the most famous brands of all time. It's studied because it is so well known that the company doesn't even need to put its name out there when it, when it uses this shell. Everyone knows um, what shell is, and that just takes me back to the point I made at the beginning of the talk, that it's so ironic that we know corporate brands as well as we do, but we don't really know the life in the ocean. And so that's one of the great poignancies um, about the Shell Oil s story. If you, if you remind me during the Q&A, I have another kind of devastating story about the Murex itself, the animal. But I'm just going to do a quick edit. Keep your eye on the Shell Oil shell. And now I'm going to show you a Murex. This is the animal for which the ships are named. And this is a wonderful mother Murex laying her eggs. They're really extraordinary animals, as are, as are all marine, mammal, uh, marine mollusks. So um, it, it, it really just was the way it was in the past, particularly um, in my childhood. This was actually my childhood seashell book. And at that time, shell books really didn't tell you very much about the life inside the shell, but they had many, many details of how to kill the shell, to kill the animals inside. Um, so this page in particular is very descriptive about how to kill them, describes boiling, freezing, and digging out their soft bodies with an ice pick. Also, um, when I was a kid, and maybe some of you remember this. In my childhood, many, um, many beach motels in Florida had boiling pots in the room so you could come back and boil your seashells and kill the animals. And some, many times there would be boiling pots out by the beach. I think these ones were in Isla Mirada. But this was just, this was just how things were. And so the beautiful thing about all of this is that there is a changing ethos all the time, right? And that is the way now we don't pick up live shells anymore. And um, just like we don't kill plume birds for their feathers and all of those things, the environmental ethos changes over time. And it's really important to know and it's important to believe that we're going to change current ethics over time as well. So kind of related to that, um, you heard that I just wrote a story about horse conchs for National Geographic. So I wanted to share a little bit with you about that. Over harvesting now, all, you know, a very long time of over harvesting has now driven horse conchs to the brink of extinction. And this is the beautiful Florida state shell. It's a mighty conch. It's an apex predator. You can see it on the right. Oh, what an amazing picture, isn't it? That picture is by Amy Tripp, um, a photographer in Sanibel. And she has captured this mighty apex predator eating a lightning whelk which is my favorite shell. Anyway, they're just, you know, they're just wonderful animals, and they are our state seashell, and they are really um, in, in danger now um, because they are, you know, they're so big and obvious and easy to see. But you can, they can, they can sell these shells for a couple of hundred dollars online. 
So um, I want to get I want to get to the point that these are these are animals that I'm going to show you that scallop again because it's so fantastic that swim. I love the way they swim. They look like those cartoon clams. They swim. They crawl. They burrow down in the sand. They flip somersaults. And they look at you with curious eyes. They are also really extraordinary architects, of course, that build their shells with minerals from the surrounding sea, primarily calcium carbonate, putting down layers of shell as they grow. And their reliance on those minerals makes them sentinels for what is happening in the oceans now. So just like in the past when they, when they helped earlier scientists explain evolution and geologic change, they were, they are telling us a lot now about what's happening to the world. So the oceans have absorbed nearly a third of the extra carbon dioxide that humans have sent into the atmosphere since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, making them a third more acidic since that time. The oceans have also taken up more than 90% of the resulting heat-trapping gases blanketing the earth. And those, I think it's hard for people to, to think about the ocean changes that are happening now because they seem invisible when you think about you know, warming and acidification. Um, but, but seashells are showing us. So too much carbon dioxide in seawater causes chemical reactions that reduce the pH and the carbonate concentration. So Ocean acidification is causing parts of the ocean to become undersaturated with these important minerals, which makes it harder for mollusks to build their shells. So this was a phenomenon first seen in sea butterflies or pteropods more than 10 years ago, and now it's beginning to reveal itself in other mollusks, including farm-raised shellfish that are really important in aquaculture. Some parts of the ocean are also becoming too warm for mollusks. Um, this is one of the theories about why queen conchs haven't come back here near shore, even though we've now banned the queen conch harvest in, for, in Florida for 40 years. Um, the, giant, the giant clam um, at left uh, dying on the Great Barrier Reef at right, a scene from this summer's great heat dome in the Pacific Northwest. It killed a couple of hundred people and, of course, many millions of mollusks. Um, I, I write a lot about scallops in this book. They're just, they're just wonderful animals. They were the sloop of Aphrodite. They're so important to human culture and human history. And in ancient times, they represented abundance. Um, and feasts and things like that. And that is one, one reason it is so um, poignant to understand that the scallops in the Northeast, um, the eating scallops that the baymen go out and harvest each fall, um, are, are, now, are now dying as a result of warming seas. So a couple of years in a row, the baymen have gone out to collect scallops and found, and found them dead. This, is a, this was on the front page of the New York Times, November 7th, uh, 2019. So um, I now, I now want to show you a really, a really gorgeous, healthy scallop. And I want to tell you where this scallop lives. This, this scallop was taken by a photographer friend of mine named John Moran. This scallop was living in the Big Bend of Florida, so sort of in the, in the curve of Florida. There are extraordinary seagrass meadows that are surviving. These are some of the, they're some of the healthiest and largest seagrass meadows surviving anywhere. And I think what's so important about this, you know, this is an area that is home to a lot of conservation land. It's a place where Florida has bought up a lot of land along the coast. It's not very populated, and it's not very polluted. 
And so when you read the stories about seagrasses dying, whether it's Biscayne Bay or Indian River Bay or Tampa Bay, um, when you read about the seagrasses dying, uh, the manatees starving, uh, scallops have vanished in many of these bays, there are places, there are these hope spots in the oceans. There are places where the seagrasses are doing well, where the meadows are lush, where the manatees are alive, where the scallops are alive, and they tend to be places that aren't polluted. So they are, you know, they, they're these really important hope spots to think about as we consider how to save the oceans. So in the in the, in the latter third of the book, I'm sort of traveling around with scientists reporting on some of the incredible human ingenuity uh, underway aimed at saving the oceans. And I also, as an environmental writer and as a science writer, it's really important for me to balance warning with wonder. Um, in fact, we know that audiences shut down sometimes when they when they hear too much gloom and doom. So um, in, in my work, I really try to turn to some of the amazing science and human ingenuity um, that's underway. And so I'm just going to introduce you to a couple of those scientists really quickly and then draw to an end. This is um, the Yale biophysicist, Allison Sweeney, um, with whom I traveled to Palau for her research that is um, looking at giant clams as a possible inspiration for algal biofuel. And so, of course, giant clams are, are fueled by this wonderful combination of algae and sunlight. It is, both are, are certainly viable fuels for us. And the, the, way, the way to think about the alternative energy futures that we will transition to is you know just like thinking about that time when um, when the Marcus Samuel brothers were transitioning to fossil fuel and John D Rockefeller transitioning to fossil fuel from whale oil we are we are just in one of those times now we too will transition from an unsustainable fuel to alternative kinds of fuel the question is whether we will do it fast enough but the, but the work out there, the, the science, the research, the, um, the possibilities are, are very, very rich. Another, another scientist I wanted to mention since I talked, about, talked a lot about Queen Conks is uh, Megan Davis at Florida Atlantic University is an aquaculture scientist with the dream of building a Queen Conk hatchery in, on every island in the Caribbean. So I just worked on another story with her, and this was a project in Puerto Rico. Um, the cool thing about it, and, and you remember what I said about human justice, the cool thing about these hatcheries are that it's not, it's not scientists who are kind of parachuting in and doing the hatcheries. This um, project trains the fishers, the conch fishers, to grow the conchs themselves. So this fellow has gone out conch fishing like he always does, but instead of um, bringing back the conch meat, he has brought, he, he looked under the mother, mother conch, he took about, took about half the shells, then he put her back in the seagrass, and now he's brought the, the, the conch eggs back to the hatchery, and here, um, here are the incredible looking conch embryos that in a few years will grow into big conchs. Um, that the fishers can then sell. So it's definitely not the answer to everything that's wrong with the oceans, but the answers will be, you know, combinations of, of, of everything from, from conservation to um, aquaculture to polluting less and all the other important science, marine science that's going on here and elsewhere. The last scientist I want to mention is Mandy Holford, and what's, what's fascinating about her from a, from a malacology perspective is that she is studying venomous, these, these animals are called terebrids, terebrids and cone snails and, and many other mollusks are venomous, and um, scientists are 
are exploring them for pharmaceutical cures. So this is, this is work that goes on all over the, all over the world. And she is looking at terabrids um, for potential for cures for a couple of kinds of cancer, including liver cancer. But the reason I want to end with her and introduce her to, introduce her to you is that what I think she's doing that's even more important is she is forging a new field called science diplomacy that is training um, young scientists and scientists at every level um, to be able to tell their story, uh, testify before Congress, um, you know, talk to the UN. This idea that um, if, science is, if scientists could, could be at the diplomatic table, um, in addition to behind their microscopes, that they might be able to um, you know, bring about more change than, than only doing their science. And she, you know, what a, what a lot of people have come to is this idea that we, we know the science. Thanks to places like this school and the incredible research going on here, um, we have come up with a lot of solutions the problem isn't so much that the science isn't there or the solutions are not at hand. It is more, um, the problems are more political, they're more financial, they're more cultural. They're all of those other parts um, of, of the culture. And so that is what uh, Dr. Holford is working on in her work on science diplomacy. And she's doing it, um, she's doing it here and around the world. And it's, it's, a really, um, it's a really promising piece of her work, I think. So in the end, I hope readers come away from this book with a sense of our oceans as the source of life and solutions to sustain it, and not just the pretty outside. And this, of course, is a lightning whelk. <laughs> so thank you very much for listening, and I look forward to your questions. Cynthia for this amazing presentation, really uh, enjoyed it. There will be a book signing of The Sound of the Sea in our auditorium Breezeway after, uh, uh, after this event tonight. And now I would like to introduce Jennifer uh, for the questions. Thank you very much. What we're going to do tonight, we've done this the last few, few in person and, and Zoom lectures, is we're going, to, we're going to take some questions from the audience and we'll have people walking around with a microphone. So if you're here in the audience, please raise your hand. And anybody online, if you put your question online, then I'll be reading them here and I'll ask the questions. So do you want to come up and sure. answer some more questions? Lovely, lovely story. Thank, <laughs> Thank you. you. So does anybody have any questions here? Here. Um, you mentioned the, what was it, the horse whelk? Horse or, conch. Horse conch um, is on the brink of extinction. Do you have any idea what their numbers are and what would be you know, a normal, sustainable um, population? Yeah, it's a good question. So the hard thing about horse conch numbers well, for one, they were the apex predator on the Florida shores. So there were, also, there were always fewer than them than smaller um, animals, marine animals. So if you, in the Indian mounds, for example, um, Native Americans ate horse conchs and used them for fishing lure weights because their, their interior is so heavy. Um, but there were always fewer of them. The problem with knowing the population numbers is that they have um, declined in population so precipitously that it's hard to find them. And by the time the first horse conch science started, which was in the 1960s, they had already really fallen off. And there was also, just like the shell craze in Holland and in Europe, there was a mid-American seashell craze in the 1950s, and um, 
when I went back and researched horse conchs, there were like tours you could take here in Miami. You could go on a seashell tour and get all the horse conchs you could in a bag. And there were, um, there, I, I saw the St. Petersburg Shell Show in 1966. You would get in free if you brought a horse conch that was, I think, at least 20 inches long. And the maximum horse conch is, is 24 inches. So it was that, you know, it's, it's not just one thing. It's decades over decades over decades over decades of too much. And so what's happening now is that the scientists have a hard time finding them to count them. And so the neat thing they're doing, and it really speaks to the importance of collections, such as the invertebrate collection here, the neat thing they're doing is that the scientists can take a historic shell that was brought in by a collector or donated to a museum by a collector, and all of this horse conch research was done using historic shells in these kinds of collections because they couldn't count the conchs. So that's how they figured out um, how, how, old they, how old they are um, when they get to a certain length and when the females tend to spawn, which was much later in life than they knew. Yeah. That was kind of a long answer. <laughs> There's one up here, a couple right here. Yes. <laughs> How long did it take you to write this book? Six Including years. A lot. <laughs> I wouldn't dedicate my time a lot to that. <laughs> There's another one right here. You. you sort of suggested we ask you a question about the devastating story of the uh, shell boat. <laughs> Oh, yes. Um, thanks for reminding me, because I actually forgot. So you saw that Shell Oil's first tanker was called the Murex. And Shell Oil has a tanker today called the Murex. And it just it, it so happens that after the book came out, I, I was interviewing a malacologist in Europe about a study that came out about ocean warming and its impact on marine mollusks. So this was something, it wasn't out in time for the book, so I was going to interview him later. And when I interviewed him, um, he told me about this part of the Mediterranean Sea. So the irony, I, I, I ended up writing about this. <laughs> Uh-oh, someone's phone went on accidentally. I ended, up, I ended up writing about this and said that shell oil tankers are not large enough to hold the irony. So anyway, <laughs> right at that part of the Mediterranean Sea, um, where the tankers, the first murex would have gone in, gone through the Suez Canal, that part of the Mediterranean was famous for those little murexes like the mother murex I showed you sitting on her egg, eggs. They were very, very common marine mollusks. They were the mollusks that the Phoenicians used to make the purple dye. They used to squish those murexes to make their royal purple dye. They were hugely common all over the Mediterranean. People ate them. Um, people consider them pests. They were just everywhere. That part of the Mediterranean is now completely emptied of those murexes because of warming. That part of the Mediterranean has become too warm for murexes. So it's no exaggeration to say that someday the only murex in that part of the world could be the shell oil tanker and not the animal. Yes. I was taking your job by calling on the people. Yeah, I have this one okay. on the phone too. So. We very much appreciate you taking the time and sharing all this information with all of us, which is so important, more important than, than many of us even realize. Because sitting here and listening to you, I, I kind of get the idea that the marine mollusks are like the canary in the mine. Yes. 
That's right. And that their warning, the, 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 their disappearance is a warning for all of us that you know, things, something is wrong. And I, I just wonder if um, there has been a study to determine how much of this disappearance is due to global climate change, how much is it due to pollution, mm -hmm. which of course influences their, their disappearance, and how much is due to over-harvesting. Yeah. Because I remember as a child coming to Crandon Park, and there were, it was just full of sh seashells. Crandon Park. And, 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 and now, you know, if you find one, <laughs> it's almost a major discovery. There's, there's hardly any left. So basically, that was the question. What, if, if we know the, what, what is the, the main causes mm -hmm. that this is uh, due yeah. to? Thank yeah. you. Sure. Thank you very much. Thank you for asking the question. It's a great question. And um, the answer is complex because the problems of the world are complex and because there are, there are like 50,000 marine mollusks known and another 50,000 probably not yet discovered and named, which is the amazing thing that, that uh, malacologists are still finding new species constantly. So the demise of marine mollusks and other marine <laughs> animals are a combination of all of the things you just mentioned. So um, pollution and habitat loss are the two biggies. And I, I asked this question so many times over six years because I was, I was interested in the fact, you know, did all of those times, and, and I write, I write, um, I actually write elsewhere of my own childhood um, collecting live conchs with my dad and spearfishing with my dad and eating, um, eating all of all of that stuff, making conch chowder. So, I was interested in my own impact on the world and how much of a difference that made. Um, in interviewing the scientists who who know these animals and who know the oceans, they say that pollution and habitat loss are orders of magnitude larger than any overcollection than we would have done um, for shells that are on the beach, for living animals on the beach. Now the horse conchs are a matter of overcollection, and some of that is very recent too because they can they have these big beautiful shells that sell for two hundred dollars online. So there is a constant um, there's a constant commercial fishery that goes out and harvests horse conch, and there is no limit in Florida. So this was, this was just, this was not known. So there is no limit on harvesting the state seashell, the horse conch, and they're, and they're being lost. So it would be a cool thing if Floridians could save their state shell. So. Pollution is the really big deal. Pollution is what, um, pollution and habitat loss is what um, killed many of the scallops that were living in most of the major bays of Florida, although as I mentioned, they are still alive and well in North Florida. Another thing that really impacts marine mollusks is um, the alteration of the shoreline. So every single bridge Every single new um, coastal development, um, every single causeway, every, every deepening of a ship channel will impact these animals in a huge way, and um, as does beach renourishment. Beach renourishment, which keeps all of our beaches looking pristine and white and sandy for us, is devastating for all of the animals who live in the sand. It, it, it suffocates and buries the animals who live on the shore. And it also harms the animals that are dredged up from offshore. Yes. And so climate change, and it's this way with many other environmental pressures, right? Climate change is a multiplying factor. It wasn't the original thing that hurt these animals or, or other um, other animals and life around the earth, but it is, it is the multiplying factor that is now 
making things happen much more quickly. And so some, some parts of the ocean, as I mentioned, have now become too warm for mollusks, and others are becoming too acidic, making it hard for them to build their shells. After listening to your response, uh, I, 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 I get the question, would you advocate in support of legislation to place limits on the uh, collection of uh, marine mollusks, like we have for other animals that we have, you know, uh, bag limits mm -hmm. and, and, and seasons as well. Yeah. For, so, like for lobster. Yeah, and, so in, in interviewing, so we do, we do limit the harvest of Queen Conk. We started limiting the harvest of Queen Conk, commercial harvest limits in the 1970s and recreational harvest limits in the 1980s. And 40 years later, they haven't come back. So obviously, that, that may have happened too late. Um, now, when I interviewed the scientists who are doing the horse conch research, they said absolutely limiting the harvest will help save Florida State seashell, the, the horse conch. Yes. Hi, we have a couple of questions from Zoom I'd like to take because we're right on our time now. And one, a few more minutes with us? Yes, of Please, course. thank you. Um, what feedback do you have about your book? Have you, what feedback have you received about the shell clubs from shell collectors about your book? That's a great question. So the question is, what feedback have I had from shell clubs and shell collectors about the book? And that is, um, I am very heartened to tell you that shell clubs and shell collectors love the book. And I'm, I'm constantly invited to shell clubs to give Zoom talks. And it's all about this ethos that I mentioned earlier. Um, this is a change over time. People don't know things like, you know, women at the turn of the, of the 20th century didn't understand that we were, um, extirpating plume birds for the um, hats with, with uh, feathers on top. Once, once society women learned that birds were being killed for those hats, they were part of the changing ethos. Um, this has happened in every, in every environmental turnaround story I could tell you. Um, and this book is not really about seashells, of course. This book is about more than that. It's about climate change and what's happening to the ocean. So I consider shell collectors a very minor piece of the problem of the, of the earth and the environment. But the, the answer to this question is really important because shell collectors today, if you're on Sanibel, they don't collect live animals. They collect the empty shells, and that, that ethos has changed over time. And I will, I will like to introduce a shell person who's here since I'm talking about this. It was my incredible honor to be invited to the Boston, uh, to give a lecture at the Boston Malacology Society. This lecture is named after a shell affectionado and indeed a conchologist named Charlotte Michelson Frank. She's 100 years old, and that Boston lecture was named after her, and she's here today. And when you see her, you won't believe she's 100 years old, but this is her. <laughs> this is Charlotte. And I just, I just love her, and I was so honored to... Um, to give her talk in her name. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, you're yeah. welcome. It, it, it was such a joy to have her speak. <laughs> and we had to do it by Zoom. And so it, it's just wonderful to be here and to meet you. <laughs> you too, you too, Charlotte. You. Yeah. And, so, um, so this generational change is very important, right? So um, 50 years ago this, 50 years ago this year, um, the United States passed the Clean Water Act, which was a huge sea change, right? Before the Clean Water Act, 
sewage poured directly into bays, including here in Biscayne Bay, um, industrial waste poured into rivers all over the country to the extent that rivers caught fire. Um, people came to a point when they said, this is not okay anymore. We're not going to live like this. And there was this belief that we had to accept industrial pollution and sewage in bays as the price of economic prosperity. And it wasn't true then and it isn't true now, but it takes the cultural change. And so that's happened in a really small, tiny way with shell collectors. But the point is that it's, it's happening in really big ways too. Um, the Miami Herald was one of the first. Now newspapers all over the country are hiring climate change reporters and they're doing an incredible job helping their communities understand um, climate change and importantly, local climate impacts. Generational change happens and it's going to happen with climate change. But this is also going to happen nationally and, and globally, just like that shift from, from whale oil to fossil fuels 120, 140 years ago. I think that was a fantastic lecture. I want to say thank you again. You're welcome. Please. If you'd like to share this with your friends, it's going to be on our, on our, whoa, our whoa. YouTube channel after this. There you go. Yeah, okay. sorry. <laughs> it's going okay. to be on our YouTube channel, and it'll be on, on Facebook as well. If you'd like to uh, support our mission here at Rosensteel, you can find our, our giving page on rsmas.miami.edu. Also, do not forget, Cynthia will be outside selling her books and signing her books if you'd like to catch up with her. Thank you. Thank you. And Christina, I wanted to say thank you to you. And Cheryl, thank you so much. I know you're out there watching tonight, too. Thanks for a great season. And to all of our sponsors as well. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you very much.